just ask the the open question. Anybody disagree with that basic description, or would you want to uh, tweak it in some way, you know, Mr. Ambassador Woolsey? I don't uh, disagree. Most of what I know about these issues, I've learned from Joe McClellan. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I want to stress that the EMP Commission did not repeat, not conclude that it's futile to protect the grid. It, the Commission recommended protecting the grid in such a way that it would fail gracefully, essentially, so it could uh, be quickly recovered. But the industry across the board has gotten very, very good at pointing the finger at okay. other parts and, of the and, business. And again, we'll, we'll get into that discussion. Right. But again, right now, I just want to lay the predicate in terms of this is what we're talking about. Got it. E1, E2, E3, the EMP versus GMD, and GMD and EMP with the E3 is that that's a similar effect. Okay, I, I just want to get that. And I also did want to, uh, you talked about a G3 level happening all the time. What, what would be the, what would be the level of the 100-year event or, or the carotene effect? I mean, wh what's that on the scale? Anybody? If, if, yeah. well, that's that's going to be like a KA, K9 effect. Uh, we haven't seen one. So we have not seen a 1921 of, a level effect. We have seen two others, um, and they're very interesting. One is in 1989. We saw about a, 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 a a half of a 1921 event and collapsed the grid of Canada. So the Quebec grid collapsed very quickly. We also saw a fraction of that event in South Africa in October 2003 that destroyed over 12 large bulk power system transformers. It was very small, so it didn't collapse the grid, but it was on for a prolonged period of time, destroyed that critical equipment at okay, a very so low level. Let's just tell you, so you had the carrington effect, which was what, 1859? 1859. Mm -hmm. and, and that in this G scale would be a G8 or 9? Yeah, well, I would say K, K9. Okay, yeah. well, okay, okay, K9, okay. Um, again, not, not that this really means anything to anybody, but again, it just kind of gives order main. So you had the carrington effect, which is kind of once in a century, but that's been 150 years. Then we had the 1921 event, which would have been, I mean, what, what would have that been on that scale? Um, yeah, I have the nano Teslas, but as far as relating it to the K factor, I'm, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to answer that question here. Way more than a G3, though? I mean, yes. I mean how, how about on scale 1 to 10? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get some sort of... Uh, idea of the magnitude of these things, from a Carrington to what we're seeing, almost background noise, but w this is happening all the time. And, and we've all seen the disruptions to, you know, yeah. TV signals, satellite signals, that type of thing, the, kind of the minor no annoyances. And I think it's also true that Lloyd, Lloyds of London says that about on, a, on average is about $2 billion worth of damage from these G3 types of effects on, annually. So, again, so Carrington was massive. 1921 was not quite as massive as the Carrington effect. Right. That's Correct? Right. And then we had, the next one was in Canada? Yeah, 1989. In 1989. Do you, do you have that on a scale? Uh, I, I do. If I, can, I can pull it up for you, but it'd be, uh, if the 1921 event was 5,000 nanoteslas, the Canadian event was about 11 or 1,200 nanoteslas, so about a fifth. I'd say about a fifth. It was a fifth of the 1921 event, and it shut down all of Canada's electrical grid? It shut down hydroelectric. So uh, uh, hydroelectric of Quebec, the entire Quebec grid, shut down in 93 seconds. Six million customers were out of power for about 10 hours. The estimated cost, I've heard cost estimates of one to two billion dollars with very minor equipment damage. So they were able to restore very quickly, but it's still the cost was very significant. But a fifth of the size of the 1921 event, which was smaller than the or less intense than the Carrington effect. Right. And then the last one was, you said, in South Africa? Right. That was a South African event. That was about, uh, uh, again, in orders of magnitude, that was probably about uh, half to uh, a quarter of the Canadian event. It was very low level. Uh, event, but it stayed on for a period of days. The grid did not collapse. It did not cause uh, consumption, overconsumption of reactive power flow. So the grid stayed on. Equipment saw prolonged exposure to this event, and, and uh, months later, over a period of months, 12 transformers were lost due to that event. And then it was true that in 2012, there was a, a corona discharge or a solar flare, whatever we want to call it, that was pretty massive. Is that, Dr. Garwin, can you comment on that? 
Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, some of these things are, are, are not really on an appropriate scale because, you know, uh, activity on the sun is not ne necessarily reflected in a, a geomagnetic event on the Earth. It depends on the polarity of the plasma that's ejected. And many of the things that happen on the sun are spectacular, but their coronal mass ejections go in different directions. Okay. So, but but I, I saw a, a satellite picture of us missing this by about nine days. Anybody know anything about this and comment on it, uh, Ambassador Woolsey? I just got a tip from my friend who was the chairman of the, or the staff director of the EMP commission. Uh, and uh, uh, he tells me that on July 23rd of 2012, there was a Carrington level uh, uh, event. It missed us by three days. That means it just went off in a different direction. Correct. But had, had, had the Earth been in its, you know, had it affected the Earth, it's going to only, if, does it only affect this, the side facing the Earth? In other no, words, no, if, if the, en the entire Earth, especially the uh, polar regions, but even down into the mid-latitudes, uh, Carrington, we, the only long wires in those days were telegraph wires. Right. <laughs> so no grid to bring down, no pipelines, uh, but it did play ha havoc with telegraph wires, burned up some tele telegraph offices, and uh, it would be much, much, much worse. It would uh, collapse societies. But if the transformers are off, they're not damaged. And so the worst that would happen if you take proper preparations is that you'd have to turn off transformers which have not been sufficiently mitigated. But the ones that have been mitigated or which uh, don't have the connections that make them vulnerable, so-called Y connections, instead are delta connections, which work just as well, uh, those are immune uh, to geomagnetic storms. Uh, and uh, I, go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, to answer your question, because I do have the numbers here. So the, uh, the July 2012 event was about a quarter, about 25 percent of the size of the 1921 event. The 1989 event that collapsed the Quebec grid was about a tenth of the size of the 1921 event. And the, the event on, it's called the, all, the October, the Halloween storm of 2003 for South Africa, that was about a 50th of the size of the 1921 event. And I do, I do have those numbers and, and can provide that information back up. But again, the real, the granddaddy of them all was the Carrington in terms of our history that we've, we've witnessed. Do you have any kind of relationship to that? I'm sorry, I don't have that, that information. But, but bigger than 1921? Yes, all bigger. So and, Wolsey. And Joe or Dick could correct me if I'm wrong, but 1921 affected, I think, uh, North America only, whereas the Carrington uh, event of 1859 affected the entire world. Okay. Now, now Ms. Borge, you, you seem to be, again, you're, you're making a distinction between EMP and GMD, and to a certain extent implying that, the, boy, there's just not much we can do about uh, EMP, so... You well, know. I certainly don't mean to be implying there's not much we can do about EMPs. I think planning and talking at a national level across the critical infrastructures, identifying interdependencies, figuring out where government can help industry and where industry can help industry and what are the most logical ways to go about addressing this low likelihood, high risk, high impact situation, as we would with many others. Whenever you're talking about a catastrophic situation, sometimes protection and mitigation has to be looked at, but so does recovery, and you have to balance how much effort should be put on ahead of time and how much should effort should be put on that recovery in, uh, situation instead. D Dr. Garwin, you, you've made four recommendations. Have you ever seen any kind of cost estimate of what it would cost to implement your recommendations? Uh, the e EMP Commission uh, has those $2 billion. They don't exactly align uh, with these recommendations. Uh, but uh, the neutral current locking device, uh, which solves the problem on the EHV, the uh, bulk transmission system, uh, those might cost about $100,000 per transformer. Uh, that's cheap compared with the several million dollars per transformer. And it's very cheap compared with the damages that would be avoided. So, do you know how many transformers have to be protected? A, a couple hundred uh, in a priority. Uh, Literally, $100,000 times a couple hundred? 
Yes, that's right. And you know, hundred thousand dollars. That's uh, so yeah. That 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 doesn't even show up in the federal budget. Tens of that's millions of dollars. Pocket change. Right. But we don't have the census. We don't have from the transmission companies uh, the details as to which transformers are most vulnerable. So we don't know where to start. So we haven't even done that. Evaluated which which 200 transformers should have $100,000 worth of protection. Yeah, and there are some that that won't help because they have their auto transformers, and so you can't separate their uh, ground, their new. But let, let, I, I, you know, Mr. McClellan, you you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I guess it, it really does depend. The substation number does depend on the on the outcome that, that uh, one is pursuing. If it's grid stability and continuity, then it's it's a small, relatively small number of substations. So 55,000 substations, critical substations, as uh, as uh, Dr. Garwin's indicated, would number in the hundreds. If, however, it's to preserve the integrity of the Department of Defense or the offsite power supply to nuclear. Uh, power stations, then criticality of load becomes an important issue. In that case, you may escalate from a few hundred to a thousand or more uh, substations. In, in addition, uh, it's important to, to uh, state that Dr. Garwin um, is, I think, focused on just one aspect, geomagnetic disturbance. Electromagnetic pulse requires E1 hardening, too. And the I, I, I understand. So uh, the point being is let's not make perfect be the enemy of the good. No. Let's not sit back and go, well, if, if you can't protect everything, protect nothing. Let's start protecting Three. things. And right. you know, literally $100,000 times 200, was it, what is the math on that? I, I, I made a mistake earlier you doing, you know, I need a calculator. It's not much, million, yeah. okay? Well, I, I want to step back and let, let's, 2004, somebody described the commissions that was established. Started in 2004 when we declassified what we knew back in the dating back to the 60s, right? When we were doing nuclear testing and, you know, we, we realized, whoa, some, something pretty strange is happening or something pretty damaging, and we classified that. We declassified in 2004, correct? And we set up a, a commission no, no, with Dr. Garwin. No, it long before. It was recognized in 1962 by a high-altitude nuclear test. It was explained a couple years later. Never was classified. The only thing that's classified is the details of the construction of the nuclear ex weapons that caused this. So, so it was just ignored. It was, it was something pretty scary, and we didn't want to acknowledge it, so we put our head in the sand, and our ha head still in the sand, by and large. Well, people tried, and of course... Well, I, I'm not blaming you. I'm, I'm just saying that's, no, that's the, 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 and, the, and the position where... And the EMP Commission have been trying, but here's what the EMP Commission said. If you look on page 6 of my uh, submitted submittal for the record. So E1, this very sharp pulse that has no counterpart in a natural phenomena and doesn't affect people, no direct harm to humans or animals. Gasoline-fueled automobiles, three stopped running out of 37, mm -hmm. but all restarted without incident. And then in particular, uh, the electrical grid. But uh, Ms. Borges is right, you know, the country runs on other than electricity, and so you have to protect more than the electrical grid. But our subject is the electrical grid, and to protect the electrical grid, even against E1, is not the big problem that protecting all of society is. So uh, electromagnetic relays that sense current and voltage uh, were immune to E1, and the electronic protective relays, they were the toughest uh, 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 devices tested and they could be even tougher, according to the EMP Commission, with minor filtering on them. So it's something that's doable, is to protect the bulk power system not only against the geomagnetic storms and against E3 from high-altitude nuclear explosions, but also against E1. That wouldn't solve the problem of society because we depend upon a lot of other things. And if all of our furnaces and water pumps and so on go out because of the personal computer type things that are used in them, uh, that's a bad day. But, but we can protect yeah. ourselves against something like the Carrington effect, the 1921 effect. And we can do that for a relatively yeah. low cost. And again, it's something that has a 10, 10 to 12 percent probability of happening every decade. And we escaped something massive by a couple days in 2012. I mean, am I stating that correctly? Yeah. So again, let's go back to 2008, <clears throat> and I want to start with you, with you Mr. Curry. Uh, I'm going to go through 
recommendations A through O of the 2008 uh, EMP Commission. And I really want just a simple yes or no mm -hmm. on these. I said, have we done this? Okay. Have we, do we understand the system network level vulnerabilities, including cascading effects? Do we understand that? Have, have, has DHS done that? No, DHS has not done that. So we don't even understand the system or network level vulnerabilities, including cascading effects? Not for geomagnetic threats. No, DHS has not done that. Okay. Well, that was the first recommendation. So, so again, this was in 2008, and now it's 2015. And I can actually do that math in my head. That's seven years. <laughs> Okay, number two, B, evaluate and implement quick fixes. Uh, they are evaluating some quick fixes, like the project I mentioned, the transformer quick fix project, and that's... So, so, so do you think uh, seven, I mean, I'm not being up on you, seven years later, that's not exactly a quick evaluation of a quick fix, is it? Right. So, so we still haven't done that. We're, starting, we're kind of evaluating it. Seven years to evaluate a quick fix that could cost minimal dollars that go a long way toward protecting the absolute critical substations and transforms of this nation. Of an effect that we know will happen again with 100% certainty, right, Dr. Garwin? This will, we will be hit by one of these solar flares with 100% certainty. Right. Sometime in the future. Right. And we have done, we've known about this publicly since 2004, 2008, these recommendations, seven years later, and we have virtually done nothing in terms of some quick fixes would cost $100,000 per transformer. When by, the, when, by the way, we spent $800 billion, 2009 and 10 on a stimulus package looking for shovel-ready projects. This, this would have been a pretty good shovel-ready project, wouldn't it? Well, the criterion was too uh, severe because it takes longer than a year uh, to go from something which is there actually to get it running. Uh, you got all that planning and uh, budgeting, and it should have lasted longer, and we should have fixed our infrastructure more widely. Right. Senator Johnson, can I, can I mention one thing? Sure, Mr. Curry. I, one of the things that makes it hard, and this has made our work really hard, is there's no one at DHS that sort of line-by-line line tracks what efforts coincide with these recommendations. Oh, yeah, no, I, 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 I'll stipulate the dysfunction within government, okay? And again, we're describing the dysfunction. I mean, th this is a serious threat. We 100% certainty this will happen, and we have done nothing, having known about this publicly since 2004. We've done nothing. We haven't spent minimal amounts of dollars on a quick fix to protect a big chunk of our infrastructure. Not perfect, not protecting everything, but just doing the bare minimum. We've done nothing. Let's, let me go on. C, have we developed na national and regional restoration plans? Yes or no? Uh, D according to our work, DHS has not done that. There may have been discussions about that in the sector coordinating councils. So seven years later, we haven't developed national or regional restoration plans. D, by the way, if anybody wants to challenge this, I mean, pipe in. and We, you know, we, got, we got plenty of time. I'm, I'm, I'm the only questioner, which is kind of nice. Chairman Johnson. Um, I, I, wish, I wish every member of the committee were here to hear this, though. It's unfortunate they're not. But again, if anybody wants to challenge us, step in. So are, do you want to say, have we developed a well, national we, regional restoration actually, plan? Actually, I want to go one beyond, one back from there. I want to talk about whether or not we've done nothing. Um, because I think the issue got a little conflated here on the EMP versus GMD. Industry has done things on GMDs. We, we have standards implemented. We're in the process of pending approval from FERC on a second set of standards to build toward the 100-year event. Have we installed anything? Have we actually protected anything? So I know. We, so we, we, so industry, great. You know, God bless you. I love industry. So industry has done some studying, but government hasn't. Uh, I couldn't say for what DHS has done specifically or not. Oh, that's why we have GAO, GAO here, and he said government hasn't done anything. So God bless industry. I'm, I'm glad you're moving forward. We should start installing some of these things. Okay. So, uh, D. Have we assured the avail assure availability of replacement equipment? Have we done that? Uh, no, it's being researched, but there's no assurance. Ah, research. Love research. Um, some of these transformers are two years out in terms of lead time, correct? Yes. Two years out. And last time I looked, Mr. Chairman, they were made only in the, the big ones, only in South Korea and Germany. So anybody with a brain in their head looking at this would go, you know, what we ought to do, again, when, we got, when we're going to spend $800 billion looking for shovel-ready projects, is shovel about $2 billion into some replacement transformers and just keep them in spare parts. 
Well, the, wouldn't that have been a rational response is take $2 billion and buy a bunch of transformers and store them well, so that we can restore power from that? Dude, some transformers aren't fungible. You can't just take one and put, uh, but people here who know more about that. Well, that, that would, of course, re require some research and some planning, which we didn't do that either. So <laughs> right. let, me, let me keep going on. As I say, the good is the enemy of the... Uh, no, the perfect uh, enemy of good, I know. Okay, that's and, and, and just government doesn't so work, and I think this is pretty, pretty you obvious. You can make replacement transformers that are modular and stack them up, and that's a good way to do it. But it's very difficult to get people to agree on a particular course. And in industry and commerce, you have competition, so people buy what's most effective. Right, what and of course, the point of this hearing is to lay bare how ridiculous it is that we've done nothing and we've let perfect be the enemy of the good, and we've allowed governmental dysfunction to prevent us from even doing the basic first little quick fixes to begin protecting our critical infrastructure. That's the purpose of this hearing. Let, let me go on. Uh, e, assure availability of critical communications channels. Have, have, we done, have we done that, Mr. Curry? So um, we focused on the energy sector, and one thing that wasn't mentioned is that the EMP Commission report actually covered other sectors, like telecommunications and banking and finance, and raised threats in those areas too. We haven't, I, I'm not, I, I don't have knowledge of the communications area. Well, again, and I agree with your, your assessment and your testimony too. So you know, we've got 16 or 16 critical uh, infrastructures and they all depend on energy. So again, when you're trying to prioritize what you're trying to address, again, not going to solve all of them. You know, in other words, do nothing without, mm -hmm. so try and start solving something. The hot top priority be protect our electrical in infrastructure, correct? Uh, F. Expand and extend emergency power supplies. Have we done that? Um, that is not something we've looked at as DHS. They would because they would not be responsible. I think that is a no. Extend black start capability. It's something that they looked at as their research and development for installing these transformers that can be easily replaced. But um, I'm kind not of, aware of So looked at it. Then that would be what we'd have to do is you know pre-purchasing some of these replacement transformers is really what we're talking about, right? And getting those in a position so that we don't have to rely on transportation to. to put them in, in, uh, in service. Mr. McClelland. Um, uh, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to revisit just a couple sure. uh, from the DHS perspective, but from FERC's perspective. Uh, regarding item number one, identify critical, uh, critical facilities. The commission did finish comprehensive network modeling, has identified the most critical uh, substations and nodes on the electric power grid, conveyed that information to the industry, and then offered assistance. And, and this is in conjunction with DOE and DHS. So they were our partners on this. We did uh, collaborate. So we have identified those critical nodes, met with the subject matter experts who own and operate those critical nodes, and offered assistance, joint assistance uh, for cybersecurity with DHS, and also assistance on both GM and EMP mitigation procedures and techniques. We've also collaborated with our partners at DOD to identify mission critical facilities and essentially perform the same function for our partners at DOD. So work has been done. I, I can't speak to independent efforts by DHS. The work wasn't specifically driven by GMD and EMP. It was driven in the, the threat context and used for both cyber, GMD, and EMP. On the second item, I don't want to overrepresent it. I think it's important to say that the, uh, the NERC standards are a baseline approach. So they are a foundational approach. They are certainly not best practices, and they certainly wouldn't represent uh, best practices that the industry could bring to bear. However, NERC did put operating procedures in place so that when they receive alerts and bulletins from the, uh, from the NOAA and uh, the NOAA folks regarding space weather events, they are given an alert and they can take operational action. That is just operational action, though. It does depend on human beings beings to actuate uh, procedures in order to, uh, to protect the system. Uh, there is a second phase of that standard. The second phase of the standard regards a self-assessment by the industry to determine whether or not they need to take protective measures, automatic protective measures against GMD. And the Commission has questioned some of the aspects of that, of that uh, standard in regards to, uh, to the one in 100 year event and the, and the baseline that the, the NERC submitted for the Commission's review. Okay, so, I mean, that's good news. I, I would have assumed we would have been looking at this, and there, I'm sure there is, you know, with all the paper being produced around here, there's, there are some studies. We need to start implementing some protections, though. 
you know, and prioritizing those things. Ambassador Woolsey. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, just one illustration. It takes uh, NERC uh, sometimes quite a while to come up with these uh, with these standards in 03 after the great northeast blackout in Canada and, and it started I think in Cleveland uh, with a branch touching a tree branch touching a wire. Um, NERC uh, undertook a vegetation management to plan. Um, it took them slightly over 10 years till 2013 to come up with that. Uh, the United States was engaged in World War II for three years and eight months. So that's essentially three World War II's that it took NERC to figure out what to do with vegetation. I don't know how long it took them to handle a much more complex problem like, say, squirrels. Mr. Chairman, if I could add one thing. Squirrels on, 100 percent probability as well. <laughs> um, that was, you know, the process, the NERC process has been changing and growing and um, establishing itself over the years, and that was more in its infancy. At this point, we, we have gotten better with standards. I'm not going to say we're perfect, but we have gotten better in the process of getting them done. And for an example, we had a request from FERC to create physical security standards last year, and we did that, I believe, in 82 days. Yeah, but but, but here, here's, again, this is a different example, but I know CDC has had established uh, standards in case Ebola virus ever came in the United States, and, you know, the first time it happened, you know, we had some young nurses come back, come contract Ebola because, you know, again, you can write up standards, and all, but if you don't test it, if you don't, don't actually have the protective, you know, gowning equipment in place, the, the standards, the piece of paper does nothing. So let's, let me just continue, because I, I just want to, and again, anybody can answer this. If, if, uh, if it's yes or no, or you know, maybe, or partially, let me know. Uh, prioritize and protect critical nodes. Have, have we prioritized and protected critical nodes? Mr. McClelland. Uh, the, uh, the studies that FERC has performed do prioritize the, uh, the, the critical notes uh, for the industry. So we However, prioritize, but no protection. No, the, the protection is voluntary. There is no EMP standard, and the Commission has said on numerous occasions that uh, for national security, the standards are not adequate. Okay, so, so listen, I, I'm, I'm somebody that hates overreaching government, okay, overregulation. But let's face it, voluntary is not working so good. Th this is, from my, from my standpoint, this is something that needs to be addressed. And if government's got to pay for it, again, that's why I, I go back to the old stimulus. $800 billion, we, we could have done a lot of protection with a, just a small little fraction of that. And it's just a shame. It's just unconscionable we didn't. I, I, can, I can just add to that uh, quickly. We have seen uh, just a handful of utilities move forward with the MP mitigation. Uh, one or two have been very proactive. The cost for both GMD and EMP mitigation at those stations is relatively small. It's been 1 to 2 percent for EMP mitigation included. You know, when, when the administration in 2009 was looking for those shovel-ready shovel projects, did NERC ever raise his hand and said, we've got one here? I wish they would have. Not to my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. There's a generic problem in the government, as evidenced by our late friend Jim Schlesinger when he was Secretary of Defense. They needed a uh, fiscal stimulus, and uh, Schlesinger came up with $5 billion to be spent. He said, we don't need it for defense, but I'm the only one in the government, the only cabinet secretary, allowed to have contingency plans for spending money we don't have. And so we spent that $5 billion on defense. Schlesinger said we didn't need it, but it was a good thing to do, according to the administration and the Congress. We ought to have contingency plans lined up for things that we don't have money to do. And you've got to be able to say no to them to stay within the budget. Well, again, the purpose of this hearing is to raise this issue, this contingency on a real high priority. This, this isn't contingency. This is an imperative. This is a top priority from my standpoint. Uh, I, expand and assure intelligent island, islanding capability. Dr. Garvin, that was part of your testimony. Have we done anything there? I don't know. Mr. McClelland? I would say not, no. Okay. Assure protection of high-value generation assets. I'm, I'm, no, correct? I guess we'll just assume no unless somebody <laughs> wants to, okay? Assure protection of high-value tra high transmission assets. No. Assure sufficient numbers of adequately trained recovery personnel. We done that one? No. 
simulate, train, exercise, and test the recovery plan. We done that? No, we haven't done that. Uh, develop and deploy system test standards and equipment. Haven't done that. Uh, the final one, you know, you can all breathe easy now. Establish installation standards. So, so this is pretty remarkable. From 2008, we had all these recommendations. Seems like pretty common sense recommendations, things that, you know, responsible individuals would have hopped right on and said, this is a, this is a problem, this is a threat, this needs to be addressed, this is a priority. And we've virtually done very little. We've done some, we've done some studies, we need to start using those studies. Uh, we are, by the way, going to be introducing a, a piece of legislation, and I've got it here somewhere. Oh, I know. This, this passed in the House. One of the reasons we're holding this hearing now is I wanted the House to move first. Um, it's called the uh, Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. Um, to me, this is just bare minimum. I mean, this is, and it was, it was amazing to me. Ambassador Wolsey, can, can you describe the, the, the problems we had even passing this in the House? Uh, it's going to require DHS to prepare a strategy to protect critical infrastructure against electromagnetic threats. I think this is the one that got through the House and was stopped in the Senate by... Peter Pry would, has followed the legislation on this more closely than I figured. I'd ask him, former sure. chief of staff of the... Yeah, why don't, why don't you come forward? I'll let you, Peter, you know, provide the information without being sworn in. Progress, uh, particularly in the House of SEPA. Well, it, it, was, it was passed in the House, but like in the last week of the last Congress. It was passed unanimously, as a matter of fact, but we just ran out of time. I think the bills you're thinking about are the SHIELD Act and the GRID Act, which were held up for years in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. One of them, the GRID Act, did pass the House unanimously in 2010, and it came over to the Senate, but one senator anonymously put a hold on the bill, and then it died, and that's the closest we came. No, I actually was going to get to the, the SHIELD and GRID Act. Right now we're just talking about this SIPA because I think the House, is it Homeland Security, ha has actually uh, reported out of committee, and uh, hopefully the House will pass it. And I want to bring this up and report it out of our committee as well, and so one of the reasons I held this hearing was to get committee support for just a bare minimum. Again, this is kind of, this is sort of study as well. Uh, but we, we need to move past studies as quickly as possible, develop a strategy, and start implementing it real quick. And I, I think some of these things we're, we're talking about here, the $100,000 for some of these critical transformers, I, I don't think we need a strategy or a study. I think we should just do it. Well, Quite that, honestly, I, that's, that's, I'll, amend, I'll, I'll amend this bill to you know, authorize the dollars to do just that. One problem is that some of these remedies are so cheap. Uh, so that the, that's the reproduction cost, but the uh, uh, design, the test, that costs really a lot of money, and then you put it into production, but you have to decide what it is you put into production. So that's why there hasn't been a lot of supplying industry interest in this, because the market isn't all that big. And Mr. Curry, you on quick? Yes, sir. On the cost issue, one of the things that we're looking at, so we, when we talk about this, we tend to talk about just replacing existing equipment now. I mean, another option that's easier and cheaper is as you redesign systems, as they need natural replacement, that you consider hardening in this too, which can be cheaper and easier to do as well. Th that's fine, but again, that's replacing, that's further out in the future. Let's take a look at what we've got now, let's address that, let's offer some protection now. I, I think I'm, I'll, I'll yield back my, my time remaining my seven minutes here. Uh, <laughs> I'll say you've made the most I, I've, of it. I've got it right, it says all seven minutes, so I have, haven't even begun. Uh, I, I will say, I, I wish we would have had, we've had really good attendance at, at these hearings, and this is probably the least attended hearing, and it's, it's uh, unfortunate. Uh, I, w I will ask... Uh, they're, all, they're all waiting in the anteroom room until you finish. So. I, 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 w I will ask that uh, you review what's already been stated here, Senator Carper. Uh, this is unbelievable. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. So if you've got an opening statement, I'm happy to... to uh, have, have you make it now. Um, but I really want you to review the testimony. I want you to review the... The, the initial questioning here, I mean, what we have not done is, is pretty jaw-dropping, and how little it's going to cost to just offer some basic protection, uh, this is something we need to prioritize. We need to get moving on this now, but why don't you make your opening statement, and then we'll continue on with questions. Okay.